does teaching feed into your writing as well? Um, well, like, it, it, when I started at the National, well, when I started at the National Theater School, um, I was a vagrant. So I started, the, and I actually was. Um, so when I got the opportunity to teach there um, and actually start the writing program, I, I, I thought, well, I don't know, what am I supposed to do? And I thought, well, why don't you just do the writing program I wish I could have had? And so I created a program that I wanted to take. And one of the things it had um, through, uh, well, in fact, this was the cheapest program ever run in the history of theater. I, I was given uh, enough money for a playwright in residency, and that was my budget. So I had to make sure that whoever the playwright in residence was could teach. And then I would sneak people into some of the other classes with actors and whatever. And, and it was all done uh, with no money and mirrors. And uh, with someone's help, I got CBC to donate a radio workshop. Do you remember the? I remember. I remember the radio. And I and I chose radio uh, a because I grew up with it, but I also knew it was a fantastic tool for the imagination. So I thought, and and also it could lead to work. I mean, holy cow, work! And so we got a free workshop to. Um, CBC uh, radio. And my roots for that was when, when I was living in Toronto before uh, going back to New York, and I was a poor writer, and security was a different issue, then I would, I would go into CBC like I owned it and go to the photocopier and just copy all my work because I couldn't afford to photocopy it. And, I, and people uh, were respectful because I was so polite. I would let someone ahead of me if they were in a rush or whatever. <laughs> but um, anyway, I don't know why I'm saying this, but it's now on record. Work, and on, work on your scam. <laughs> yeah. Your politeness scams. That works in question number four. In terms of uh, advice for playwrights, work on your scams. That's but are, are there any, uh, uh, or no, it's not advice for playwrights is our next question. Uh, do you have any advice for computer programmers, veterinarians? <laughs> how they could think like a playwright if they're trying to solve a problem. <laughs> well, um, w one of the things I'm currently working on is a kind of digital textbook roadmap of the creative process. And it is a way of th thinking creatively, problem solving creatively, and by that I mean not just filling in someone else's blanks to the, to the question, um, but al allowing yourself to, to focus in on it and step back and get a bigger picture of it. Um, I think it's a real shame that in the lower grades of school, um, art and creativity is, is sort of made this elitist notion. I mean, it'd be like um, in gym, only those who are gonna become professional hockey players can take gym. And the same thing with art. At a certain point, uh, at a certain age, um, it's only for those spoiled brat kids who are artists. But every human being uh, has something to express and has an interesting take on things. And we're, we're born with this extraordinary gift of curiosity that um, our school systems, I believe, have been very effective in squelching. But if you can return uh, people to childhood curiosity, they'll be able to creatively solve anything. I do not know how to answer this okay. question. Sorry. I don't, I do not know. That's my advice, don't be afraid to say <laughs> you don't yeah, know. Yeah, right. yeah. I don't know how to, I don't know how to solve it. I would be afraid if my veterinarian thought like a playwright. But <laughs> I, I feel like, for me, the, the, the great lesson of writing for me is that it's so practical. And that the idea that every day, you just, if you just wake up and do your work, and then the next day you wake up and do your work, and you, you just keep going at it, you will get something. Like, can, like the consistency of effort is, has been a revelation to me. Like the work of it is a revelation in a weird way. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't preclude the openness and the creativity, but the work itself is. Well, you're kind of saying but the craft of writing yeah. is, is something that you're more familiar with now doing the TV work. And, and I, 
by craft, I don't mean like in a hacky way, like, like you know, like at all. I mean, I think that the reward of the, like that, to, if, you, if you're lucky enough to work at something that you like, then you are, the work itself becomes its own kind of interesting thing every day. There's also a, a level of commitment and persistence, and on some level, I believe, um, whatever the problems are going to be, a belief that a solution exists. Yeah. Um, I used to be really good in math, um, and you can only do math if you really believe there is a solution. Once you're convinced there is no solution, you'll never, you'll never solve it. Um, <laughs> And uh, here's an experience I'd, I'd like to share, connected. When I was at NTS with, uh, you know, gifted young artists, as a counterbalance, occasionally I would go up north in northern Quebec to work with kids who had zero contact or interest in the arts. And so I had to redefine what creativity was. Um, and so when I met these kids, I told them, it's like, breathing. Um, it, you need to breathe to express your physical being. And creating is just a way of getting to know who you are. So I said, look, you're at the age where you, you're about to have to make important decisions for your future. Do you want to make them as your teachers? Do you want to make them as your parents? Do you want to make them as your peers? Or do you want to make them as you? And every creative expressive act is a reminder to you of who you are are. Um, and I, and I, I remember sharing this with the, with the kids, and that was fine. And um, at the end of it all, the, the teachers who worked at the school would you know, take me out for a drink. It would be like a week-long workshop with extraordinary things going on. And they would say, oh, man, well, the kids said you, you allowed them to say whatever they wanted. And I said, well, I mean, um, yes, that's part of the process, and um, and one guy said, "Well, well, we once one uh, an hour every week we let them say what they want to," <laughs> and I said, "Well, they're not hot and cold water faucets. You can't turn them on and off like that." And one guy said, "Well, what if they're smarter than you?" I said, "Well, great. Then you get a chance to learn from you." But I could tell that as soon as I left, whatever I had tried to put in place would be um, erased. And one of my, I mean, there was. It's hard for me not. To, it's hard for me to talk about without getting affected because some extraordinary things happen from kids who were not looked at as having anything worth saying, um, and these were kids with mental issues on parole. Um, you name it. And I remember one group of 15-year-old boys, and they were debating whether to thrust them on me because they were wild. And they said, "Oh, he's here. Let's do it." And they came in, and they were screaming and pushing each other and blah, blah. And, uh, but then w when I started, they were quiet. And I thought, well, that's, that's OK. Good, you're quiet. But I said, you know what? I appreciate your, your being quiet, but you were way more creative when you came in and you were pushing each other and calling each other names and screaming and shouting. Can, um, can we figure out how to do that without total chaos? And then this one kid made a wisecrack. I said, that's a good wisecrack. You're my assistant. And now everything has to come through you to me. <laughs> anyway, it, was, it, was, it turned out to be a terrific class. And I remember talking to one of the teachers afterwards saying, that kid has never spoken in class. He's caught between being in a gang and not in a gang. And I didn't realize he was that smart. Anyway, um, that's, there, are, there are many uses of the creative, self-expressive um, willingness to say, this is who I am. I'm always amazed at, um, like I do a lot of workshops with um, the, what used to be the Canadian Auto Workers Union is now Unifor, and they have this um, paid education leave program, and they bring artists to, they bring like visual artists and um, a, a musician, and I do um, theater with like these people who are by no means, you know, artists, like they're, they drive. They're, um, you know, paramedics, they're nurses, they're cashiers, they're miners, they're 
like auto part makers and it's always so intimidating because I'm like, oh my gosh, they're going to hate me. But they're so excited and so excited to create and actually be able to tell their stories or vent their frustrations in a way that's creative. And so I think that would be, you know, my advice would be being able to get the opportunity to do something creative because it just reminds me that uh, how fortunate I am that, to, that I have an outlet like that, that, these, that people are craving the opportunity to play and to be able to say in a constructive way what is bothering them or what they're excited about or what they wish or what they dream. And it's so beautiful, the work that they create.